My name is Robert Heaney. Uh, I have the honor of being the director of the uh, Center for Anglican Communion Studies here at Virginia Theological Seminary. We're very excited uh, to welcome you to this, our second centerpiece event in our 20th anniversary year. Before Dean Markham formally welcomes our keynote speaker and opens uh, the evening, let me take a moment to say something about the vision and practice of our center here. We exist to promote and practice better community for the Anglican communion. This we do guided by three imperatives, reflect, resource, reconcile. We create space for Episcopalians and their neighbors to reflect theologically amidst affection and disaffection. When and where and how do we discern the voice of God amidst challenge and change? We produce resources to equip Anglicans for the mission of God. That often means consultations, research, publications. Right now we are in the midst of producing work on religious peace building in settings of conflict and producing work on mission partnerships across differences, all of which we hope will resource the Lambeth Conference in 2020. As well as current work on consultations and publications on theologies of reconciliation, we are also involved in partnerships and grant-funded work in practices of peace building in sites of conflict here in North America, but also in West Africa and in the Middle East. All of that work depends upon the grace and the spirit of the risen Christ. It depends upon relationships initiated and relationships deepened. It depends upon a humble confidence that distinctiveness and diversity is God's call to the Jesus movement. But more than that, it depends upon a humble confidence that this diversity, this distinctiveness, this inherent and irreducible interculturality is God's intent for God's work of creation, recreation, reconciliation. Congratulations on the 20th anniversary of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies at Virginia Theological Seminary. For 20 years now, you have helped us in the Anglican Communion to grow more fully as a communion that follows the way of Jesus as a community that spans the world. The Anglican Communion is representative of the family of God, a family that crosses all national boundaries, a family that crosses racial boundaries, family that brings together people of all stripes and types who would follow the way of Jesus. We are blessed to be part of that Anglican family, and we are blessed to be witnesses of God in this world. And one day, all people, all races, and all nations will truly live as the human family of God. So happy birthday to the center, and may your work continue for many, many years to come. I would like to congratulate Cax on celebrating your 20th anniversary. I am grateful for the communion because our diversity reflects the beauty of God. I just want to uh, send my greetings and say congratulations uh, to the center on its very important milestone, 20 years of faithful witness and service, uh, not only uh, to uh, the population in America, but the whole Anglican community. Um, I would like to wish uh, the Center of Anglican Communion Studies um, the wonderful 20th anniversary celebrations. Um, thank you to Dr. Robert Henney and the staff and all of your team members for working hard in this space of commun Anglican Communion Studies. Congratulations to the VTS Center for Anglican Communion Studies that you've reached 20 years. In English terms, you're one year short of being adults and getting the key. I suspect you've all had that for a while. You have done brilliantly. It's wonderful that 
you exist. For me, the Anglican Communion is a bewildering, extraordinary, miraculous, diverse, remarkable range of cultures, of languages, of attitudes, of people living in wealth and immense poverty, in security and immense suffering all round the world, brought together by God the Father to proclaim the love of Jesus Christ through the grace of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the greatest miracles of the church. Well, a very warm welcome to Virginia Theological Seminary and a very warm welcome to those of you watching online. We are indeed, as you probably deduced from that video, celebrating 20 years of remarkable service by a remarkable team in the Center for Anglican Communion Studies. And I would just like to pause and recognize the hard work of our director and uh, his team here. Yeah, please let's recognize Robert Heaney, Molly, and Bartlow. We have appropriately made this a year uh, celebration. It started back in November with uh, the Secretary General of the Anglican Communion. Archbishop Josiah addressed the whole issue of the vitality of world Anglicanism and reminded us that we are part of a big global family of some 85 million adherents, which they project will grow by 2050 to 165 million. And this is the second event uh, entitled, Why the Episcopal Church Needs World Anglican. It's my duty and privilege to welcome our keynote speaker, presiding bishop, Michael Curry. Michael Curry uh, was installed as the 27th presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church in 2015. He has degrees from Yale University Divinity School, Princeton Theological Seminary, Wake Forest University, and other studies at St. Mary's Seminary and the Institute of Christian Jewish Studies. He has honorary degrees from Episcopal Divinity School, Sewanee, Yale, and of course, Virginia Theological Seminary. <laughs> he is well known to us all as a remarkable gifted leader. He served in the uh, Episcopal Diocese of North Carolina uh, from 2000 and has become uh, a prophet prophetic voice to both the church and the nation, addressing every conceivable topic, immigration policy, marriage equality, but crucially always locating it in the Jesus movement and our obligations to be effective disciples of Jesus and witness to that love that Christ brings our hurting world. He has built an international reputation for being a bridge builder and a voice for reconciliation. In three short years, of his service, the Anglican Communion has already enjoyed and benefited from his Christ-centered and compassionate leadership in world Anglicanism. He's an author, including songs my grandma sang, and he's a fearless advocate for the Communion and its importance. Distinguished guests, panelists, sisters and brothers, you are welcome to Virginia Theological Seminary and the Center for Anglican Communion Studies 20th anniversary lecture Please join me as we welcome our keynote speaker, the Most Reverend Michael B. Curry. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean, Dr. Heaney, to members and supporters of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies and the Virginia Theological Seminary. I really do thank you for this invitation to be able to share with you in this commemoration and to give God thanks for the work of this center. Now 20 years, it, it really is a privilege and a blessing. Allow me, if you will, to um, share some thoughts. I, I loved the question, um, why the Episcopal Church needs world Anglicanism. 
Um, I felt like I was taking a general ordination examination again. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it'd be a great question, actually. But it really is um, provocative. Uh, it was provocative for me for a number of reasons because it forced me to think back. Every once in a while, it is helpful to think back origins and deeper purposes. And then you begin to realize why we do what we do and who we are and frankly why it really matters. So allow me, if you will, just to open this with just a brief preface um, that may seem disconnected from the subject, but I think it's intimately connected to it. And, and then I hope by the end you'll see the connection and we'll be able to engage conversation with the panel and with questions that have been generated. Now this is a, a talk, a lecture, it's not a sermon, um, but if it was, I would have a text. Um, <laughs> And, and I know it's not, so I won't have a text from scripture, but I'll get the next best thing from a preacher. You know him well, Dr. Martin Luther King. In the last few years of his life, he began to say over and over again, and I quote, we shall either learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we will perish together as fools. Choice is ours, chaos or community. It's really that simple. He began saying that in the later years of his life as his poll numbers were down, if you will, as his popularity was plummeting. The, this was long after the march on Washington and the articulation of a dream that he wondered if it was really real. This was long after the early days when he was still young and vigorous in Montgomery, Alabama. This was long after civil rights bills had been passed and voting rights bills had been passed. He began to say these words when there were riots in streets, Watts, Detroit, Newark, all of our major urban cities. He began to say it as young men and women were coming home from a war far away in Vietnam and the nation was beginning to tear itself apart, he wasn't sure if its government was telling it the truth and didn't know why we were sacrificing so many young men and women. He began to speak about it as criticism of him began to rise because he began to speak beyond simple civil rights and began to speak of human rights and began to make connections between the sufferings of, of African Americans and the sufferings of Native Americans and the sufferings of oppressed peoples of different stripes and types and races and colors and began to see the interconnections between the sufferings and injustice of people here in this country and around the world and he was not popular. He began to say it over and over as he realized that the suffering of poor people, poverty knows no color. If you're poor, you're just poor. And if life is hard, it's just hard. And he began to see that poor white folk and poor black folk suffer the same things. And he finally began to say with a word of prophetic sorrow and hope, commingled. We shall either learn to live together as sisters and brothers or we will perish together as fools. The choice is ours. Chaos or community. I'm here and you are here. And this center is here. And this communion exists regardless of the historical circumstances that gave rise to it. I know about the British Empire. <laughs> that ain't had nothing to do with religion. <laughs> Regardless of the historical circumstances that human beings had in mind, God had something else in mind. This communion exists and we are here and this church exists because we believe that Jesus of Nazareth has shown us the way beyond the chaos to community. He's shown us the way. If I didn't believe that, look, I'm 64 years old. I'm getting 
things from Medicare supplements in the mail. <laughs> I could call it a day and go home and relax. No, no. I'm here and you are here. We are here. This church is here and this communion exists because we believe that Jesus of Nazareth has shown us the way to community. And that that way into community, true human community, as God intends and has dreamed from the very beginning, that way is the way to the life of the world. And it is the hope of the world. Now, I probably could sit down because that really is basically all I need to say. <laughs> but let me dig down a little deeper into that, if you will. Why the Episcopal Church needs worldwide Anglicanism? The truth is, and we don't often think of it here in America, but it's true here in America and around the globe. We need worldwide Anglicanism because lives are at stake. I remember a few years ago, a number of years ago now, I can't remember the year, but it was, uh, this was soon after um, the consecration of Bishop Robinson, so it's probably 2000 five-ish maybe, or maybe six, we were having a House of Bishops meeting in New Orleans. Um, and I know Shannon, you might have been there, Chilton might have been there. I can't remember. Uh, but I believe Bishop Catherine was the presiding bishop at that time. And um, it, was a, it was a time when there was real tension in the communion. And I mean, the tension had reached a fever pitch. Um, and the then Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Rowan Williams, um, came and members of the ACC came. Um, and the Anglican Communion Office. I mean, there was a real delegation present with us in, in New Orleans. And um, in the midst of that, I don't remember all that was said, but I remember the Archbishop saying one thing that I have, had not heard, I had not thought of, and I have not forgotten. He said at one point, we need this communion because without it, some lives will be lost. This Anglican communion is one of the largest human service delivery systems in the world. Just behind the Roman Catholic Church. There are hospitals that would not happen without it. There are schools that would not happen without it. There are medical programs and programs that save people's lives. People might die without it. This is not a recreational cruise ship. This communion is about the life of the world, the life of the children of God, all of us. And it matters. I'm very much aware of the fact that it doesn't seem obvious. And yet I've, I've been with our brothers and sisters in the Anglican Church in Ghana. And I've seen where Christian Anglicans and Muslims are working together and training local clergy and imams in local communities so that they can engage gender-based violence where women are subject to extreme violence and cruelty and where local clergy can both intervene, provide safe means, and do the kind of education with men as well as with women and families to bring the scourge of violence against women to an end. I've seen it. I've seen it, and it's happened because of the Anglican communion. Otherwise, do you really think that the Episcopal Church in the United States and the Anglican Church in Ghana would actually be paying attention to each other if we weren't family? Truth is, we are an Anglican family. We may be dysfunctional. <laughs> right? Right? But, but God help us, we are family. <laughs> you know? Bishop James Tangatanga uh, from Malawi now at, um, he's at another seminary. I can't remember where it is, Dean, but I, it's another hill. Um, Swanee somewhere, uh, yeah, somewhere. There, like, but uh, James, when he was um, uh, heading the uh, Anglican Consultative uh, Council and uh, was still serving as bishop in, in Malawi, um, used to say, even in the midst of our, 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 our most difficult times, he said, you know, the truth is, in baptism, Jesus has made us family. And nothing can tear that apart. Nothing. It's indelible. 
We may be dysfunctional, but God help us. We are family. And lives are saved because of it. Children are educated because of it. That's truth. I was at the um, Carter Center um, in Little Rock um, about two, I guess it was about two years ago, and had been asked to come and share um, on ways that religious communities can help in sustainable development in the developing, in the developing world. And so there were a number of, there were um, scholars in international development um, who were studying there at the Carter Center were present, and then there were some um, students and grad students. Um, and then in addition, there were a number of corporate leaders um, who were involved in uh, international development, both as their primary work, but also those who take seriously their role as a global citizen. Um, and so there were some folk there. And I could tell that, I, I said, this is, a, this is going to be an interesting con congregation. I didn't know if I was going to get an amen out of anybody. It was just kind of a, I said, we've got to work with this gang. Um, <laughs> and, and it was really fascinating because on a certain level, th those particular groups, um, you know, um, not-for-profit entities working in international communities um, and for-profit, they have a tenuous relationship with each other, and, and neither one really has a deep relationship with religious communities. And so I said, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not asking y'all. I'm not going to do an altar call, but we are in Little Rock. <laughs> and that's not unfamiliar territory, but I need to call y'all to the altar. It's time for, for us to learn to work together. The truth of the matter is, for these large corporate entities, for these large global entities that do engage poverty um, and needs uh, throughout the world, the truth is you can only get so low. You don't have connections in local villages. You don't have connections in little communities. But let me tell you who does. The Anglican Communion, the Roman Catholic Church, Lutheran World Fellowship, the Mennonites. I can go on. These churches have been on the ground for years. The Roman Catholic Church is the largest single delivery of health care on the continent of Africa, bar none. The Anglican Communion is one of the largest providers of education around the globe, single providers of education around the globe. Let me tell you something, Anglicans, Episcopalians, we do education right. And while you add education, you can get a little evangelism in it. Two birds for one shot. This is a good deal. Uh, uh, the, the truth is, I was telling them, these churches are actually indigenous now. We actually are parts of the communities. We're not aliens. We actually, this is who we are. If you really want to change lives, work with these churches. Some of you may remember the Nets for Life campaign of Episcopal Relief and Development about five or, I'm losing track of time. It's been a number of years now. Um, um, uh, to the, the Nets for Life using Nets to reduce um, malaria infestation. Um, it, was, it was far more successful than Episcopal Life ever dreamed, um, and corporate America came to Episcopal Relief and Development because our system was actually working. And let me tell you why it was working. It was working because we are part of the Anglican Communion that the system that the Nets for Life uh, set up in, in Episcopal Relief and Development, it, the same, they were the same anti-malaria nets, and they were eventually given to families and people in local communities, but here's the difference. We had a network already in place. We had a network called Anglican Churches. There were uh, provinces, and there are dioceses with bishops. I know folk got issues with bishops, but they're good for something. And you've got provinces, and then you've got bishops, and then you've got parishes, and these parishes have missions, and it's actually connected from the diocesan and provincial level to the local village. And they use that network to train the caseworkers, use that network to create a system not only of delivery, but training the folk how to use them, and then setting up a system to both repair and replace. It's a successful system. I said, corporate America, Wake up! You got a business partner and we don't even want some money. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> but we want to do a relationship first. <laughs> I mean, the truth of the matter is, why does the Episcopal Church need the Anglican Communion? We are out of business without it. And the truth is, 
Lives are at stake. But even more than that, even more than that, our life here is at stake. Now, I could get in trouble for what I'm about to say, so I'll speak of myself. I'm, I'm, I'm an American, um, African-American. I mean, I've been black all my life, and <laughs> been American all my life, too. <laughs> I mean, this is who I am. And I know me and know, I think I know us. It is so easy for Americans to think we're the center of the world, that we're the biggest, and that we're the best. And forgive me, I'm going to say it, and that we're exceptional. We ain't exceptional. All God's children are exceptional. And that's bigger than America. But there is a sense in which we easily focus just on ourselves and on our life and our role in the world and forget there's a world out there and we're a part of it. And we can't survive without that world and that world can't survive without us. We are interconnected, tied in networks of mutuality, as Dr. King once said. What affects one here affects all here. We are tied together. And I really believe that a spiritual practice, stay with me, for us as Episcopalians, at least in the America, in America, in the U.S., a profound spiritual practice is to learn that we are Catholic church folk, that it is not just us, that we are part of a worldwide communion and fellowship of faith, of folk who follow the way of Jesus, and they are our brothers, and they are our sisters. We need that for our soul's salvation. And without that, we are lost. Why does the Episcopal Church need worldwide Anglicanism? The truth is, we need each other. The reality of climate change I'm not getting into the politics of it, but the reality of it is real. And the truth is, what affects one part of the planet affects the whole planet. And what affects one part of the human family will affect other parts of the human family, whether we like it or not. At the last Lambeth Conference, um, 2008, um, each, each day was... Um, you know, set up around various subjects. And so, you know, it was the, the bishop and the Bible or the bishop and this and the bishop and that. And, 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 and of course, there was the day when we had the bishop and human sexuality. Um, but there was one day um, that was given over to the bishop and the environment. And we were asked to share our experiences of the impact of the change in the climate. And to be very honest, those of us who were Americans and for the most part from the Western world, the Northwestern world, had little to say that day. Because the impact of the change in the climate was not hitting us in obvious ways yet. It is now. But it was hitting in the Southern Hemisphere. And I remember dear brother from Tanzania, who recalled when Mount Kilimanjaro, with its great and stately peaks, with snow-capped peak, as a child described it now as an adult, seeing that snow-capped peak there, barely there. I remember Bishop from Zambia talking and describing how the growing seasons have changed and now there is less food. And it's not because of just natural things. The growing season has changed, and people will starve. But I was most deeply moved by the then bishop of the Solomon Islands, 
who spoke and reminded us of the movie. Some of y'all old enough to remember PT 109. Do y'all remember that? About President Kennedy when he was young ensign in the Navy on a PT boat in the Second World War. And they were shot up and eventually they were rescued and, and survived. Bishop of Solomon Islands had seen that movie too. And he stood up and he said to us who are Americans, he said, my brothers and sisters, we have been your friends. We were your friends, your allies during the Second World War. My people, my family saved John Kennedy so that he could become your president. And now the waters of the ocean are rising and will take away our home. America, we need you now to be our friend. Archbishop Thabo from Southern Africa, who was on the video just a moment ago, has been one of the leading voices in this Anglican communion and one of the leading voices in church communities for engaging climate change seriously and calling on our leader, the leaders of our nations. And if the leaders of our nations won't do it, then our, I'm going to get in trouble now, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. But if the leaders of our nations won't do it, then our corporate leaders will do it. And states and municipalities and cities, we can do this, a people's movement, to do whatever we can and everything we can to stave off as much of this climate change as possible. We can do that. We can do that. We can do that. And a movement to that. It's going to be grassroots, and you don't get any prettier grass than the Episcopal Church. <laughs> Why does the Episcopal Church need the Anglican Communion? Well, the bottom line, and this is a theological truth, we actually need each other. You remember that parable or that, that story <clears throat> from it's, it's in the Gospels um, of the paralyzed guy whose friends were trying to get him to Jesus. And Jesus was in, in this house and there were so many people around, I guess, that um, it's like every Episcopal church. It was just packed to the gills. <laughs> um, and, and, and they couldn't get him to Jesus. And so when they tried to get him through, you know, the doors and the windows, there's, and he couldn't because there were so many people, they, they remember they pulled the roof apart and, and opened it up, and they lowered him down through the roof. The truth of the matter, that is a parable of what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Because sometimes you may be one of the ones helping to lower that, that, that brother who's paralyzed and needs a healing down to Jesus. But on other times, it may be you who needs somebody else to lower them down. The truth of the matter is, this, we need each other. And this following of Jesus, let me tell you something. I love me some Jesus. And I want to get to heaven, not soon, but I want to get there. <laughs> uh, and I believe following him makes a difference. But let me tell you, it ain't easy. It is not easy to follow Jesus. It's not easy to love. It's easy to love lovable folk. It's not easy to love some folk. It's not easy to forgive. It's not easy to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. It's not easy. Can't do it by yourself. That's why Jesus said, wherever two or three gather in my name, I'm going to show up. He's trying to tell us that. That's why he always sent folk out on mission in groups of two, in groups, not by them. We can't do this by ourselves. We need each other. I come here from having been in the Virgin Islands, having just been in the Florida Keys, having just been in Puerto Rico. I came here directly, well, on Delta through Atlanta, <laughs> sort of directly from Houston, Texas. And while we were paying a pastoral visit there with Bishop Andy Doyle 
and the good people of that diocese and the area of Houston and Beaumont and that Golden Triangle area. We'll go to West Texas next month. While we were in Beaumont, they told us the media forgot about us. When the cameras left Houston and, and Harvey, the storm, left Houston, they forgot the storm just moved over a little bit east and stayed over Beaumont in East Texas. And we were devastated. And nobody knew. And it felt like we were all alone. And one of the clergy who was there sharing the story said the news media was gone. But we got emails and letters and cards and notes from Episcopalians all over the Episcopal Church, Anglicans all around the world, as well as other people of different faiths and goodwill and decency. But it was particularly the Episcopalians and Anglicans. We didn't even know we were Anglican. <laughs> he didn't say that. Yeah, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. <laughs> But, but the truth is, we, we, we got all these cards when nobody else seemed to be paying attention. And he said there was a particular Sunday when they got back in their churches, in their church, and he could tell people were just dis dispirited. And he said instead of a sermon, he read letters and notes and emails and cards from Episcopalians. He read notes and letters and cards from Anglicans from all over the world and other Christians and people of faith and goodwill. Sometimes you may be late bringing down the paralyzed man, but sometimes you may be the paralyzed man or woman yourself. We need each other. That's why we need the Anglican communion. And lastly, and I really will stop, this goes back to our text. We shall either learn to live together as sisters and brothers or perish together as fools. The choice is ours. Chaos or community. And Jesus has shown us the way to community. I believe that our share in the heritage of the communion is due in great part to the fact that the very integrity of our witness to the way of Jesus is at stake. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, in first century Palestine and 21st century America. You will be my witnesses, 85 million of you in 165 countries dispersed throughout you. Anglican communion are my witnesses. It ain't about you. Yeah, Jesus said ain't. <laughs> Especially when he was in the southern part of Galilee. <laughs> said, yeah, you will be my witnesses. This, this is my movement. I need you to be my hands, my feet, my life. The integrity of our witness to the way of Jesus is at stake. Go make disciples of all nations, listen to the language. All nations, all ethnoi, everybody, all stripes and types of people. Go, make disciples of them, teach them to baptize them, and teach them to follow in my way. That's what, that's what this is about. Create a community that is not defined by its diversity, but defined by its unity following the way of Jesus. Do y'all get that? This is incredible. Because if we're following the way of Jesus, I don't think I was supposed to come out of that, but, <laughs> but sorry about that. But, but, but if we're following the way of Jesus, right, following him, then you may be a Republican and you may be a Democrat. But if you're following Jesus, that doesn't matter. He does. Oh, my brothers and sisters, that is the witness to the way of Jesus and its power to transform our humanity from its jangling discords and somehow dare to make the music of a beautiful symphony.
That is God's dream. That is our work. To help God fashion and help the human family become the beloved community of God. What's that old hymn say? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. God bless you. Okay, get back. today to give thanks to God for the 20th anniversary of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies at Virginia Theological Seminary. What an incredible 20 years it's been. As an alumnus of the seminary, I am proud to be associated in some way with the work of the center, its ministry of building bridges throughout the Anglican Communion. It's a great pleasure to be um, speaking to you on this 20th anniversary of the uh, Center for Anglican Communion Studies at uh, Virginia Theological Seminary. Um, great celebration as, as we reach 20 years. So congratulations, that is wonderful. Uh, I'm here just to say congratulations to the Center of Anglican Studies for this time of celebration of 20 years of service and learning. And just thank God for the Anglican Communion to which we draw our common liturgy and worship and we draw our diversities in that table of fellowshipping around the throne of God and just allowing him to teach us and to guard our hearts as we serve humanity. Thank you. Just be energized for greater service. Congratulations to the Centre for Anglican Communion Studies, of ETS, on 20 wonderful years serving the church. To me, the Anglican Communion means working together within the love of God to serve his world, bringing the good news of Jesus and his kingdom so that people may flourish as they address some of the most difficult challenges on our planet today. So um, I would just like to add my voice um, of welcome to the welcome of the deans. It's our uh, pleasure, it's our joy to uh, welcome our presiding bishop. It is also my privilege to have the responsibility of welcoming our panelists. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Catherine A. Grebe is the Mead Professor in Biblical Interpretation. She has taught at Virginia Theological Seminary for almost 25 years. She received a BA in Philosophy and Religion from Holland University, a JD from Columbus School of Law at Catholic University of America, LLM with distinction in canon law from Cardiff University and an MDiv from Virginia Theological Seminary. Her PhD in theology was awarded with distinction from Yale University. She's an ordained priest in the Diocese of Washington and serves on the clergy team at St. Stephen and the Incarnation. She is an author of many articles and book chapters and is currently researching and writing on the book of Hebrews and the Sermon on the Mount. Her uh, book, The Story of Romans, a narrative defense of God's righteousness, with, was published uh, with acclaim by Westminster John Knox in 2002. She is founder of the Pauline Soteriology Group at the Society for Biblical Literature, has served on the board of the Journal of Biblical Studies and the Journal of Theological Interpretation and was president of the Mid-Atlantic region of SBL. She is a keen traveler. She has deep experience in the Anglican Communion as friend, 
scholar and leader. She was one of seven scholars tasked by the presiding bishop to write a response to the Windsor Report, which was published in 2005 as to set our hope on Christ. She served on the Inter-Anglican Standing Commission on Unity, Faith, and Order, and on the House of Bishops Theology Committee, as well as on the Special Commission on the Episcopal Church and Anglican Communion in preparation for General Convention 06. She teaches regularly at the Canterbury Scholars Program at Canterbury Cathedral, and is sought after as a teacher, a scholar, and retreat leader in the wider church and communion. The Reverend Kathy Walker is a senior at Virginia Seminary. At the launch of our 20th anniversary year, she was the student body president, a gifted and generous leader in this community with a proven record of understanding and relating across differences. She lives by a simple yet profound creed, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. She is a candidate for Holy Orders from the Diocese of Southeast Florida and is currently fulfilling her education, field education requirement at the Episcopal Church of the Atonement in Washington, D.C. Her vocation is expressed in a desire to share the love of Jesus Christ. As a senior, she's excited about God's call to her as a priest of the Church of Christ in the Episcopal Church and within the Anglican Communion. The Reverend Halim Shakir is a senior studying at Virginia Seminary. He comes from the Diocese of Jerusalem, which includes Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, and his home, Lebanon. His home parish is All Saints Beirut, where for some years he has been involved in a variety of Arabic language and English language ministries. A skilled and sensitive leader in this community, he is president of the seminary's Mission Society. In this role, he has demonstrated a vision and leadership for discerning the mission of God through prayerful partnership across the communion, as well as his commitment to mutual understanding and learning in the communion. Halim has a particular interest in interfaith dialogue, Christian formation, and liturgy. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel. So the format for this evening is quite simple. Some of you may recognize it. Uh, I have a series of questions uh, that emerge in light of the presiding bishop's uh, lecture and work, and we're going to talk about them together. Uh, members of the audience were asked to submit questions before this evening's event, and we look forward to discussing uh, those also. If you are one of the people who submitted a question, and you got a response from me, the only um, thing I ask is that you stick to the question you submitted. <laughs> All right, so let's begin with our panel. Um, as you listen to the presiding bishop, uh, what did you hear this evening? Dr. Grieb. Thank you with me. Um, so many things. I, uh, why should... Um, why do we need worldwide Anglicanism? Because lives are at stake. Um, more than, so many examples of that. Um, but, but, in, but people around the world are in danger, in peril, um, because of environmental crises, because of health crises, because of, of wars um, and, um, and, and other, uh, horrible things that are happening uh, uh, in camps when they can't get home, uh, all, the, all of the, the places that, that are needing um, us. Um, lives are at stake. Um, and I also hear him say that it's, uh, we've gotten so much, we've gotten so many gifts. Um, we now, people are saying to us, we need you now to be honorable. We need you to pull, uh, to pull your weight, do your share, use your power, particularly on the issue of climate change. Um, uh, he, the Bishop, Archbishop reminded us that um, but the, the friends in the story of the paralytic are the heroes of the story. They, they, they got the, 
um, the, the person to, to Jesus for healing, but that we might find ourselves in the situation of the paralyzed person as well, um, and that um, the cameras don't always, and the media don't always uh, cover the, the people who are most in need, but they are, they can feel lonely and cut off without support from the rest of the communion. I think the thing that, that went right to my heart uh, that he said was that the integrity of our witness to Jesus is at stake. Um, Acts 1.8 calls us to be um, witnesses for Jesus, our feet, our hands, all nations, everybody. Um, we're to teach them and we're to teach them by, uh, by serving, by looking like Jesus, doing um, what Jesus would do. Uh, in that situation. I heard a lot more than that, but that's a start. Mm, right. <laughs> Kathy, what did you hear? I heard um, the bishop say that as much as the world needs us, we need the world, and that it's an equal kind of partnership, and that when we lose sight of that, we're losing something very valuable and something wonderful for all of us. Um, I think that I, I heard the bishop say that um, the time for a, a sort of sense of arrogance on the part of Americans that we're just here to go in and save others without trying to save ourselves is really a, a big mistake. Mm. And that was the biggest thing I got out of what I heard. Halim. Uh, I heard the bishop saying, first of all, I want to congratulate Cax for the 20th anniversary. <laughs> and I am very thankful for the work of Cax. Because okay. I am here standing on that platform because of CAX works and BTS. So mm. thank you mm. so much. Uh, what the Bishop Kerry you have said at life at stake, I will give you an example from our diocese. As you have known, the diocese of Jerusalem and the Middle East, it covered five countries, very troubled world. And we have like 35 institutions which work, schools, hospitals. Mm. And the only hospital that in Gaza is the Ahli Hospital which is belongs to the Episcopal Church and the Diocese of Jerusalem, which saves lives. And in our institutions and in the schools, we have like around 90% of the students are Muslims. And what you have said, this institution give witness to, to Jesus and the word of Jesus and the work of Jesus. And what you have said, Bishop, and what I have heard you that we have to follow Jesus I have followed Jesus from Lebanon, which he has worked, from Sidon and Tyre, mm. and until following him to Virginia, and I end my follow to will be in Dearborn in Michigan. So this is the Anglican communion. Mm. It works from the east until the to west, and it combines all this world. And here in, in this hall and in this platform, we have students coming from all around the Anglican communion. And this is what you have said, the love, and the family. Sometimes the family, as you have said, we are family, in the, we sometimes we have diversity and we sometimes we don't agree, but we are one family and especially we are the family of Jesus. So thank you so much, Bishop, for your work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So thinking of what you heard, um, is there a question, um, let me rephrase that, what question emerges? <laughs> I'm not giving you a choice. What question, what question emerges from what you heard uh, Bishop Curry say this evening? And we'll stay with you, Halim. So Bishop Curry, you started uh, with uh, Martin Luther King and dream. I want to ask you a question, Bishop. If you now we had meeting for the Anglican communion and you're standing off in front of uh, this crowd of the Anglican communion. What is your dream for the Anglican communion? If you said, I have a dream for the Anglican communion. You asking me? Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your dream for the Anglican communion? It actually goes back to the very last um, thing that I, did, that I said at the very end that we would bear witness to the way of Jesus and follow him and serve the world in his name with all of our differences, no matter what. 
And that's a witness to humanity. Because if we can do that as the Anglican Communion, then that means it's possible. And if it's possible, then it can happen to the human family. And we don't have to live the way we've been living. We can learn to live together. That would be my dream. Actually, it's not mine. I got a feeling it's God. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Wow. Kathy, a question that emerges for you. The question that emerges for me is, so often it's easy for people to believe bad things. And I think that for many people in the pews, they really believe that we are one step away from being out of the Anglican communion. So when we hear conversations like the ones we're hearing tonight, it is immensely inspirational. And the question is, how do we disseminate this information better so that people know what we're really doing as Episcopalians in the Anglican communion? Well, I guess that goes back to part of the mission of the Center for Anglican Communion <laughs> Studies. <laughs> well, and, and, and in, in fact, um, I mean, just this form and, and some of the work that, that you're doing um, and that's being done, and I know you're already doing it, but to actually find ways to disseminate that via social media and all of the various ways that we have of communicating with folk, um, maximizing that and utilizing that um, is, is one way to get um, get both messages and conversation uh, going and some of the resources that you have, interfaith dialogue and that kind of thing. Um, the, the more that can be disseminated and, and, and used and encouraged and encouraging bishops and clergy in parishes to really use it. This is part of our work of reconciliation to actually use it. I think that's the kind of, I, so I, was, I was really, wasn't really kidding when I said the work of this center is the work in part of ha helping that to happen for the normal Episcopalian, whatever a normal Episcopalian is. But you know what I mean? For just the average normal Episcopalian who's not gonna be at conferences and is, you know, all that. But we got access to them that we didn't even have 15 years ago. I mean, social media, I know it's a blessing and a curse. I, everything is. But the truth is, we can reach people we couldn't reach before, including Episcopalians. Um, and so I think the more that can be maximized, um, Dr. Grief. I'm, as I think about what you've said, I think about the, um, the I, I go back to the, to the civil rights movement and remember the resistance uh, that you spoke of. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. became increasingly unpopular when he started talking about the Vietnam War, uh, when he started talking about economics, when he started talking about the, um, the, the structures and changing the, the structures rather than the, than the, the signs, the, the, the demonstrations and the, and the, the moments, um, and called people to long-term long -term commitment to change. And I, I just, I wonder if you could comment, well, let me just, one more thing. You have a gift for humor, uh, using humor. You touch our, the wounds of our country and our church lightly. Um, and we know they're there, um, and you have a you have a gentle touch. I, is there are there ways we can teach people to use that energy and that loving humor to get through our own resistance to Jesus' mm. call? Um, I'm, there's a quotation from Oscar Wilde: um, "If you're going to tell people the truth, you'd better make them laugh; otherwise, they will kill you." <laughs> <laughs> Um, <coughs> and I, it comes to mind at times like when we're talking about Jesus and following Jesus um, and when we're talking about Martin Luther King Jr. and, um, and others who have put their lives on the line. Um, we're, our lives are not on the line tonight in this room, um, but you've touched us at a place where we're called to do more than we have done. Um, and I wondered if you could say something about both our resistance and ways we can get through it. Wow. Thank you, Professor. Um, you really are a professor. <laughs> 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 right. 
you know, I'm not sure this is going to be as helpful in a reply or response, except uh, I, I'm very aware, um, one of the things that I'm aware of is that, it, at least in the church, um, there actually are some shared values and, and beliefs. There actually are. Now, I mean, they, they may be articulated differently, and, I mean, but, 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 they're actu but they actually are. And I'm more and more convinced that if we begin to respond to our call from those values that we do share, that that's a, a space, if you will, where I don't, nobody feels excluded, or that's minimized. And that creates, that creates the possibility of common ground where there's space for all of us. I think that's really true in our civic life, that it's in the area of shared values that we actually will find our commonality, and then we can build from there. Um, if you start with issues, you're dead, because automatically, it's automatically polarizing. Um, but if you start with what we share, um, and some of my humor is really the humor of humanity, it's actually teasing up the flawed, fallible, funny, wonderful, <laughs> sinful humanity that we actually share. That's common ground. And that common ground creates, you see what I'm getting at? It creates space for us to walk into some tough stuff and to deal with that, um, not in a flippant way, but in a deeper and engaged way, but bringing as many of us along in the conversation as possible. Um, and I really do, I mean, it. it it should be easy in the church. The truth is, we got Jesus. He's really helpful. <laughs> uh, um, because it's really kind of hard to argue with him. If, 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 you know, it's kind of like, nobody wants to disagree with Jesus, you know, because <laughs> you might really see him later on. <laughs> but, um, but the truth is that there's a, there's a place that we actually share that we don't claim as much. I mean, that, that's part of why I'm encouraging Episcopalians to say that name Jesus and actually get, I'm so glad you're doing your book on Sermon on the Mount. Um, I mean, that was once the catechism of the church. That was once how people were taught, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, look, look at the Sermon on the Mount. That's kind of what it looks like. Um, I'm, the, the, the truth is that Jesus of Nazareth creates that common space, at least for those of us in the church. It's actually already there. And to engage him deeply and each other deeply makes it possible for us to walk to Via Della Rosa together, the way of sorrow and pain together, because we're actually walking with him. Um, and so I really do think that, I really do think Jesus is part of the key going deeper in, with him in that journey and with each other um, and engaging the world and, and, the, and the issues of the world in our lives together from that. So it, so it is, the humor is actually our humanity. Just kind of lifted up and teased up. <laughs> when you look at it, it actually is kind of funny. <laughs> um, and that Jesus is actually our common, our shared value. That's, he's one thing we, we share. Um, so, thank you. So let's test that humor and humanity with a question from the audience. Um, if you just um, put your... Put your hand in the air when uh, we call your name. John Musser has a question, uh, a question uh, that several people raise relating to the nature, future of the communion. John. Thank you. Uh, Bishop Curry, uh, in your talk tonight, the key phrases, uh, world Anglicanism and Anglican communion have come up. Um, the co these two concepts of Anglican communion and world Anglicanism, however, are dynamic ideas that have changed and evolved in their meaning. Um, so my question is twofold. What might it look like for the Anglican communion to redefine itself in ways other than participation in the instruments of communion? And what might it look like for us as the Episcopal Church, church to interact with world Anglicanisms that might not fall within the communion fold? Thank you. Hmm. Is that all of us? Why don't we start with you? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor. <You're welcome. laughs> well, I have a theory about Anglicanism, 
and 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 I and and this I'm you know I'll go ahead and <laughs> say it. Um, there's an instrument of communion that's not listed in the instrument, but I think it probably is the instrument. Now Jesus, obviously, but I'm not. I mean. I think the Anglican communion is a network of relationships that were born in shared experience and a shared way of being Christian that the Anglican tradition holds up for us. It is a network of relationships. That's what the Anglican communion, it's not structures and it's not organization. In fact, it's not organized. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's really not. I mean, it, it's, it's Anglican. We don't do organization. I mean, it's... I mean, but the truth is, it's relationships. And it's relationships that have their origins um, in missionary work. There's folk around the globe. Um, and there's a history to all of that. But it is those relationships that were actually born in mission that actually is where the Anglican communion is found. And there's an ethos and a way of being Christian that is reflective of that way. There's an Anglican way of being Christian. Um, I mean, you go, one thing, you go like to an 8 o'clock um, service anywhere. I've been to 8 o'clock services um, all over the communion. And I swear, it's the same people. <laughs> it, 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 it's the... It, it's like, it's the exact same people. Uh, uh, but it, <laughs> so I think the key to all of it is, <laughs> is the instrument of communion or instrument of unity that actually are our relationships with each other. The, and that's beyond primates and that's beyond Anglican consultative council and that's beyond all of that. All that's important, it is important. But I think that is really a reflection of those relationships. That's who we are. You talk to a Christian who's an Anglican long enough and you'll smell them Anglican. And I don't know how that works except I know it's true. Um, oh, if you don't believe me, like I said, go to 8 o'clock service. And you'll see it. Does that help? Tease up a little bit. Thank you. And I, I, um, I want to um, ask Dr. Green the same question, but maybe putting the emphasis on that second part of the question, which was you know, reimagining the communion and what are the implications for that imagination on how we relate to people that say they're Anglican but might fall with, uh, outside the, the Anglican communion structures. Right. It's a wonderful question. and, and um, first of all, I, I just w want to say about instruments as a term that, that we, we, we use, but it, it does, it, we need to remind ourselves we're talking about people. Yeah. We're talking about the Archbishop of Canterbury and being in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury who, who has a ministry of, of visitation and holding things together, who intervenes in the life of, of bishops and nations at crisis points and uh, is well informed by that wonderful network we have. Mm -hmm and is able to do things behind the scenes that governments can't do. Um, and we're talking about the Lambeth Conference that brings bishops from all over the communion to one place every 10 years or so uh, to talk about the things that are on, on the minds of the communion. Uh, the bishops don't come just for themselves, but they bring their, their, their provinces, their, their churches with them. Um, and the, the needs and the issues and the pains of being Anglican in a particular time and place are heard and felt and cared about by the others because of that, because of that structure. And we're um, talking about the, the primates meeting um, that, that happens when it needs to every couple of years and the uh, Anglican Consultative Council that is our, as close as we get to an organization. Uh, at least it has a budget and a constitution, right? But, um, <coughs> But um, uh, that, uh, that, is, that is the most representative of the, f of the four instruments um, uh, with, with women in, in, in leadership positions and laity uh, all over the place. And uh, it's, uh, it, all of these are different ways of, of building that network. So um, I, there are maybe a million ways of doing, doing uh, more on top of that, but I wouldn't want to lose those, those uh, basic those basic instruments of communion, I think they're golden for us, all four of them. Um, and, what, and the Mother's Union, that's a, a, a mm, candidate fifth. for the fifth, yeah, yeah. Um, and Canon Law is a canon, ca mm. candidate for a fifth, but um, I think your networks is, a, is probably the best of all. Um, what about the, the people who have, um, 
who, are, who want to call themselves Anglicans and, and they can do that and don't see themselves as being in the Anglican communion, that is, don't define themselves as not being in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, Barry, or in our particular neighborhood as not being part of the Episcopal Church. Um, you know, there are a lot of them. <laughs> I thought that really you just needed to know a few words, you know, some acronyms like ACNA and this, but um, I, I went back on, online again today um, just to, to sort of, this is, this is the pages and pages of splinter, Anglican splinter groups that, are, that define themselves as not being part of the Episcopal Church or not being part of the Anglican Communion. Um, and so I, I've been thinking about this question um, all afternoon. Um, what is our, what, what, do, what, what do we do about that? How do we interact with them? It seems to me that it's, that it's, it's like a marriage. If, if we're, um, we're married <laughs> to the Anglican communion, we're a family and the uh, head can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And, and the eye can't say to the ear, I'm not an eye. So I, you know, I can't, the ear, I, I don't belong to the body. We belong. We belong because we're we're baptized and we're it's this is our family, um, and uh, it's at times dysfunctional. It is our family as we we heard that loud and clear tonight. So when someone if you're if you're in a marriage and somebody says wouldn't wouldn't you like to go um, have a conversation with this other person spend an evening, I think I'd want to make sure that everybody knew what kind of what kind of an evening it would be and what kind of an evening it wouldn't be. <laughs> um, I mean, the signals, the signals need to be clear. We're, we're, um, so we, any kind of, I, I hope we would be in conversation with anybody who ever wanted to talk to us about anything. Um, on the other hand, these are people who are, have defined themselves over, be, uh, by leaving us <laughs> um, and, and saying, we, we don't like this, this, and this, and this. There's a whole long list of things they don't like, um, predictable. Um, and uh, so we would have to, I think we would have to begin by saying, we are in communion with the, Angli with the Archbishop of Canterbury. We are part of the Anglican communion, and that's not really negotiable for us. Um, if you still want to talk, that's fine, but you're the ones who left. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I mean, the other thing I suppose we should say is that people change their minds and come back. And the, um, the church is generous. We've had bishops who thought maybe they were supposed to be the, in the personal ordinariate and took a look at it and thought maybe it wasn't such a good idea after all. And um, there are conversations about how to, how to come back. Um, but those, are, those need to be done carefully. Um, I know that, there, that the presiding bishop's office has people who work with people, particularly who are skilled um, to help people who want to talk on a, on a very formal level about what's possible and what isn't in terms of, of coming back. But just for people who have no intention of coming back, well, we have a lot to talk about in terms of Christianity, but maybe not so much, um, not so much in terms of, of what's negotiable about the Anglican Communion, because we're married. Mm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Veronica Travis has a question. Thank you. Uh, my question is about um, what might have changed or expanded, if anything, about your sense of mission since you've been meeting with other primates and visiting other parts of the Anglican Communion since you've become the presiding bishop. Uh, how has your understanding of mission changed, right? Changed or expanded or, or maybe not, but can you say a bit more about that since you've become the presiding bishop and been meeting with other primates or and in other parts of the communion? You know what, it, it's, it, it's probably evolving and I'm not aware of how it's evolving, but I can tell you where I think it's deepening. And that may be close to mm. your question. Uh, uh, you remember that st the story where it's after the resurrection, it's the end of John's gospel where Jesus and Peter um, have this conversation. And, you know, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he asked him three times and Peter, you know, the whole story gets, well, I'm in the seminary, you all know the story. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's interesting that Jesus, whatever else is going on in that story, Jesus keeps pulling Peter into relationship 
that may be a healing relationship for whatever's gone on in Peter's life in the past. But he keeps pulling him into this, do you love me? And that is, that's marriage. That's language of intimacy and relation. Simon, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love Three times to the point where Peter just says, will you quit asking me that? I mean, you're supposed to be the Lord. You're supposed to know it. But anyway, it's all right. It's all right. And, and it's only after he keep pushes him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Engaging a relationship that he then says, now follow me. You know, you may go where you don't want to go. Another will take you by the hand and lead you where you do not want to go. But that relationship, it may be the basis of your discipleship. I, I, something I'm learn, getting deeper about, I'm not sure it's a change, but I can see it more clearly, is that mission is not a scientific endeavor disconnected from people. It is predicated on and dependent on human relationships that then in time blossom and grow in ways of serving and bearing witness in the world. But that, that relationship is the key, it's the key to everything. I say this as an American. Americans have a hard time with that. I remember when I was bishop of North Carolina, and we were in a, uh, one of our companion dioceses, was the Diocese of Costa Rica. And um, we kept having groups wanting to go down to Costa Rica and do something. Kept wanting to go build something, paint something. And I'll never forget Martha Alexander, yeah, paint anything, just not paint something. I mean, it's like, it's, and Martha Alexander was the chair of the committee and really had to work with our folks is that first you've got to get to know each other. You've got to create relationships, and then there's a basis for mutual figuring out what can we do together. Um, and, and I really do think those relationships, missional relationships, are what give rise to authentic missions that, that will endure, that will endure the test of time and changes in leadership and changes. So I'm seeing, I'm getting clearer that relationship is it, everything. It is, it's, it's the key. Um, Thanks. So, so let me broaden uh, that out a little bit for our panelists. Um, how has your understanding um, of mission changed as you have experienced cross-cultural relationships at seminary uh, and beyond seminary? Kathy, you can start. When I came to um, seminary in 2015, I think I had the same sense of mission. The only thing I knew really was it was a fun trip you try to get a bunch of teenagers to go somewhere and paint buildings, and then there might be a little religion thrown into it if you were lucky, if they, weren't, if they didn't fall asleep. And then, <laughs> didn't get too late. Um, then um, I took the cross-culture colloquy class that's offered here, and actually I was one of only two American students in that class. The international students are required to take it, and American students are not. And that was a very interesting um, dynamic in the classroom. Um, in which um, there were seven of us who took the class for the entire year, and it just changed the whole trajectory of my feeling and understanding of mission. Because through the relationship building with the international students, I came to understand that A, they weren't too interested anymore in people just coming to paint things, or to, you know, or for us, again, to go in and say, I, you know, they asked us for a, for a water fountain, and instead, we decide we're going to dig wells. You know, so we are always the people going in and trying to determine what it is they really need, despite what they've told us. And so that was an incredible, incredible time. Halim and I took that class together. Um, and it was just a wonderful way of building those relationships and beginning to learn that, hey, it's not monolithic just like it is in, in America. So everybody in Africa doesn't need the same thing. <laughs> you know, everybody in, you know, in Navajo land, we talked about this, even in America, does not need the same thing. And how do you figure that out without conversation? So um, I think that for me, um, I would say that, A, that class should be required for more students, and especially American students. I think that's important that we, too, understand. Because if we're going to be on this journey together, then we've got to have conversation. We've got to talk to each other, not at each other. And we can only do that when we have a place and space for dialogue. Halim, same question. Uh, I second Kathy because we took the same course. <laughs> <laughs> this whole event's about advertising my classes, by the way. Yeah. It's 
a great class, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But the most important thing is the relationship. Uh, as for me, uh, coming from the Middle East, the relationship that I built with my American classmates, which was a very gr great experience to know about the Episcopal Church. And, and I think like a lot of the students, also we came as an international student, we had a relationship. We are coming to this dinner, like uh, Dr. Kripp, you have said. We're coming to this dinner as an international student. We don't know what will, what will this uh, end. But because of the relationship that we have built through either two years or three years, we learn more about the Episcopal Church. And I am very thankful also for VTS. It gave me an opportunity to go and visit Myanmar. And I learned about the Anglican Church in an Asian country who has suffered and it was under a brutal uh, regime. And then how it had a relationship as a, a, a Christian and a Buddhist community. So this experience, a cultural experience that I had here at VTS, it was a great experience. It changed my mission. And now as a president of a mission society in the VTS, it gives us more broader how the mission can the church and how can see God's image in every work that the church have done, either in the United States or in the broad Anglican communion. The truth is we're out of time, but I do want to ask one more question. And so answers are gonna be short. All right. um, so we've all of these experiences uh, in the communion uh, beyond the US. Is there a story? Is there a, a proverb, an experience, an image which speaks to you particularly as illustrative? of why the Episcopal Church needs Anglicanism. Catherine, let's start with you. <laughs> um, the first proverb that comes to mind, I think there are two. Um, one is that many hands make light work. And I think that when we join together and um, form coalitions, it makes this whole idea of bringing others to Christ that much easier. And I think that particularly in the times in which we're living, it is so very important. I, I was talking to um, uh, the dean of the cathedral from Chicago earlier today, and I said, if we can't convince people right now that we need Jesus, I don't know of another time when we're going to have this opportunity. <laughs> I think we, this is it. <laughs> we, we should be able to do it right now. Um, so I think that that's just incredibly important. And I think and a lot of that has to be driven by faith. And so then I think about Martin Luther King saying that faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the entire staircase. So those would be the two proverbs. I would say. The picture that it comes from my mind is from Book of Acts. This is a small community of Christians that come in Gentiles and the Jew. And with all their diversity, they troubled the world. They turned the world up down. And I think like as an Anglican communion, as your Bishop Kerry said, we are the largest second institution in the world. If we work together in all our diversity, we can trouble the world on. And let me say, even the, Dr. Heaney, your question, why does the Episcopal Church need the Anglican communion? I think also the question that the Anglican communion needs the Episcopal Church. Let's work together, come with a relationship together because the Episcopal Church can present a lot of experience and the work for the Anglican communion. Both together we can trouble the world and turn the world upside down. Mm. Don't agree. I have two proverbs also. One of them is an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, travel alone. If you want to go far, travel together. Um, I think there's wisdom in that. Mm. I think it's self-explanatory. The, the other one that I, that I would pick is, is uh, the, the road to a friend's house is never long. Mm. Um, I think what I've learned most about mission is hospitality, mm -hmm. the importance of hospitality. Um, I, the, the, uh, we all know that, that those who have the least often give the most, and those who have the most sometimes give the least. Um, but I've been overwhelmed 
over and over and over and over again by um, by hospitality uh, from by uh, Anglicans around the world, and eventually, you know, it becomes it penetrates, and you think I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop Curry, what comes to your mind? Image, proverb. Well, I mean, I, um, I'm beginning to see the illusion of global independence. Mm. Um, that the notion, I mean, we're interdependent whether we like it or not. We just, we really are. Um, and, and, and I think the communion is, the Anglican communion is, is maybe one of God's witnesses to that global interdependence. Uh, to that human interdependent, that may be part of our vocation and charism. I don't know. And when I was thinking that that occurred to me, um, I remembered something that um, Congresswoman Woman Shirley Chisholm said, uh, and other people have said it, but she actually was the first one to say it. And she was talking about the American experiment, but but translated globally, and and she said, um, you know, the truth is, we all came over here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. <laughs> <coughs> and living that out and realizing that we got to sail and move together. Mm. And that may be mm. a hope. Mm. Thank you. So before I offer a final thanks, uh, a couple of little announcements, real, one really, and that is to say that there are refreshments, uh, reception in Scott Lounge immediately after we close, if you don't know the way, there will be ushers to direct you. If you would just all go straight to Scott Lounge, we will catch up with you. Um, so just go straight to Scott Lounge uh, right after this. Um, we want to thank you uh, for joining us this evening. For those that joined us on the live stream, we do hope that you enjoyed the conversation and the lecture as much as we have enjoyed it in the room. Indeed, the Episcopal Church does need uh, the Anglican Communion, as the Anglican Communion needs the Episcopal Church. We owe a debt of gratitude to our keynote speaker this evening, the Most Reverend Michael Curry, Presiding Bishop and Primate of the Episcopal Church. And we owe a debt of gratitude for our insightful respondents, Dr. Catherine Grebe, Reverend Kathy Walker, and the Reverend Halim Shakir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.